We thank uh, the organizers, uh, Manshi, uh, SR Arvind, Dr. Manoj Chavla, Bharat Abu, for inviting me here. <clears throat> I landed at 5.30 and I was thinking if there were 25 people in the hall when I give the lecture at 7.10 or 7.20, uh, my lecture will be successful. The whole conference will be successful. So here we are, more than 25 people. My uh, topic is divided into two, two parts. One, you know, other is proposal. What you know is what I'm going to present in next six minutes. Burden and phenotype of obesity in India. You see, this is our first paper in 2007 with more than 1,000 citations. One of the best cited paper as far as obesity in India is concerned, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology Metabolism, where we showed that already obesity was increasing in India. And subsequently, my colleague, uh, Ranil Javardhne, and our, our, our group, we showed that whole of South Asia, there is increased burden of obesity. And this was 2010. And then subsequently, the uh, National Nutrition Monitoring Urban Survey, 2017, showed that in men and women in different states, obesity percentage has increased up to, up to 50. Now, this is based on the revised recommendation of obesity by our group in 2009. So, this is the revised classification based on that. So, already a high proportion of people are obese. But a more representative survey is this one in 2000. Uh, this is the National Family Health uh, Survey uh, in 2016 versus 2021, and again showing the same thing that in both men and women, more in women and more in urban areas versus the rural. Uh, but, uh, we also know that Indian bodies carry more fat. And this was uh, shown by my colleague uh, Nabal and our, ourselves in another highly cited paper in nutrition in 2004, where we compare the uh, Indian population. This is the, this is the rural urban slum, urban and migrant Indians versus Chinese and uh, the Mexican Americans, Caucasians and African Americans. This is the BMI. Uh, and you can see the BMI of Indian population, not very much. But if you look at the body fat, have the highest percentage of body fat, 33 percent. This versus the highest BMI was African American. Their body fat was just 20. So that this Slide alone, I've been showing in various conferences, makes the point that we have a higher body. Also, all the abdominal adipose tissue depots are high. And if you look at the abdominal adipose tissue cross sectional MRI at lumbar vertebra 2 and 3, uh, and if you look at this, the superficial abdominal adipose tissue, uh, the deep, uh, this superficial subcutaneous abdominal adipose. Tissue, Deep, there is a deep uh, subcutaneous ab abdominal adipose tissue and intra abdominal adipose. All three depots are higher in Indian population as compared to the Western population. And we have shown it, and others have also shown it. And if you look at this data in uh, the Europeans versus South Asians, intra abdominal visceral adipose tissue, subcutaneous, deep adipose tissue, this is mostly at the back, the deep adipose tissue, mostly here and the superficial abdominal, all, all are higher South Asia. Um, the other point which has been made in various conferences is the liver fat. And there are not many studies available which have comparative data between the Indian population versus Western population. There is only one study actually available. And if you look at this particular study, uh, there the liver fat were measured using an MRS spectroscopy. And if you look at the the triglyceride percentage is almost a half times with more highly insulin resistant Asian Indians, 2.6 times more hepatic fat. A meta-analysis recently showed that liver fat is, is the most important element as far as body fat depots are concerned. In Indian population, it is much higher than the Western population. Uh, and we recently showed, and this is General Clinical and Technology Metabolism paper, where we showed that dapagdofosin decreased liver and pancreatic fat when given for uh, uh, 120 days. This, this is the data for liver. So 
we have some solutions which are coming up as far as this liver fat is concerned. But what is left is often in discussion is the skeletal muscle and which is not often talked about and this is again a very good study uh, which, which, uh, which actually compared the skeletal muscle mass between the blacks, white and South Asians and, and it was shown that South Asian has six points lower grip strength. So the, the strength of the grip using a Jamar uh, dynamometer was much less with a lesser skeletal muscle mass and this alone while adjusting for body fat and BMI, this alone was responsible for 12 times higher uh, prevalence of diabetes. So don't think the fat is always important. It is the muscle which is also very important. Those who are sarcopenic, it an independent risk factor for diabetes. So this has been compiled in our, our uh, uh, review on body fat, metabolic syndrome, and hyperglycemia, diabetes. Uh, complications, uh, diabetes and its complications in general, and uh, we have compared the various adipose. So the consequences are important to see that non-obese people, non-obese people, those who don't have much of a body fat, body weight, have high inflammation and insulin resistance. I'll show you one slide. Earlier onset of diabetes at a lower BMI. Rapid conver conversion of pre-diabetes to diabetes, more diabetes-related complications. And then, as a consequence of all this, we need to change the definition of diabetes, uh, uh, of uh, obesity, based on all these. Now, if you look at the, uh, this particular Schulman, Peterson's paper, the liver fat I showed you was this from this paper. But look at the other things. The comparison between Asian, Indian, and Caucasian, these were young people with a non-obese BMI and non-diabetic people. Non-obese, non-diabetic people, Asian Indians showed higher inflammation, with inter high interleukin-6, leptin, etc., and muscle fat apart from high liver fat. So young population have high inflammation, high liver fat, and high liver fat. And this we, we showed also when we compared non-obese patients with type 2 diabetes with non-diabetic control, Non-obese people, less than 40 years of age, had a high prevalence of insulin resistance. We published some time. And due to all this, we developed the uh, diabetes at a lower BMI. Now, this is the, the comparison between South Asian, Chinese, blacks, and whites. And when do they develop? What BMI do they develop diabetes? And this is the 24 BMI. We developed Chinese at 25 and whites at 30. So at 30, if you compare, we are developing at 24. Uh, all these and more data were reason for changing the obesity definition. Uh, we developed the diabetes at one decade younger, and from normal glycemia to diabetes curve is very steep. So pre-diabetes to diabetes conversion is very steep. And if you apply the same modality, lifestyle, walking, exercise, and diet, to a white versus Indian, the Indian's reversion from pre-diabetes to normal glucose regulation is half that of white. So it is easier in white and more difficult. That's why we need more exercise. That's what Shashank was saying, that we need more data about these things. And we have more complications. Clearly, you can see the uh, if you compare number of ethnic groups, myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, and end-stage renal disease. So with this, this is the common minimal point of Indian phenotype. And it is, it is wrong to say that it's a thin fat phenotype. There are a number of other points. It's not thinning at fat, a number of points. Lower BMI at higher abdominal adiposity, higher liver fat, higher magnitude for insulin resistance, and lower beta cell. This itself is a phenotype. Lower age of onset to diabetes, rapid conversion from pre-diabetes to diabetes, and higher nephropathy and CVD. This is the whole phenotype of in patients with diabetes. So, right in 2009, we realized some of these things. Not all, not all publications were available at that particular time. We realized one thing, that our body fat was high and we are developing diabetes at a lower BM. And that's why in 2009, in this JAPI, 
paper, which is highly cited paper, it, 1,178 citations uh, recently accessed, and which was, we were the first one to rethink on this thing. And after this, the NICE guideline changed for migrant nation in India, and then the ADA also changed its guidelines as far as the, uh, as far as the, um, the uh, screening for diabetes is concerned. All 23 BMI and 25 BMI for migrant uh, Asians or Asian Indians. So this was the change guideline. Overweight, 23 as opposed to 25. Obese, 25 as opposed to 30. Waist circumference, 90 as opposed to 102. And 80 as opposed to 88. And this was a, uh, these are the data from WHO and Indian Obes uh, International Obesity Task Force. But is this enough? Is, is this guideline good enough? This is what we have been thinking for the last one decade. A number of other guidelines have come in. Look at this, uh, the Edmonton score, where it says 0, 1, 2, and 3. And each one has metabolic, mechanical, mental, and milieu, environmental issues. All were taken in account. Is this the guideline we are going to use? Is this simple or difficult? That is the problem. So, if we have to use for all general physicians sitting here and sitting in Delhi and sitting in some village, it has to be simple. Widely applicable in all settings, reproducible, based on generally reliable evidence, based on general consensus, should be ethnic specific and based on the evidence that we have generated in this particular country. Now, there's a Lancet Obesity Commission going on. I'm part of this Lancet Obesity Commission. They are way off. They are looking at so many other things uh, which are perhaps not applicable for Indian public. So, in 2009, we did not consider that this definition will lead to grouping together of those who just have excess body fat and those who are dysfunctional in any manner because of. So, there are two categories one only obese, no problems. And the other are obese and have organ discomfort. The two. So we begin to realize that there is a dichotomy between the two. So we need to define what is obesity. Is BMI a good measure of obesity, obesity related organ dysfunction? What is clinical obesity? So we have decided that we should name it something different because it is causing dysfunction, clinical obesity. Do we add more measure? to BMI to make it more representative of adiposity and adiposity depots and should be functional measures be added to definition of Next five, six slides I will explain to you. What is obesity? Simple obesity. Excess of body fat without affection of organs. So you may be having a high BMI but your liver is functioning fine, your heart is functioning fine, you are non-diabetic, you are non-hypertensive, you don't have dyslipidemia. You just have obesity, nothing else. Uh, what is excess of body fat? Body fat more than 25 in percent in males and 30 percent in females, according to our research paper. This is the only research paper available in India. Is this ethnicity specific? Yes, Indian population. This is the cutoff. So, BMI limits for overweight and obesity are already set to be used for epidemiological or research purpose. So, if you want to do, use, uh, you know, do a research in epidemiology, you use BMI. But if you are treating a patient, then you have to consider a lot more. Is BMI a good measure of obesity, organ dysfunction? Look at this guy. This guy is Dwayne Johnson. His BMI is 33.5. He has more muscle than fat and he has no disease ever. BMI alone may not reflect cardiovascular disease as much as the other measures. So this was our initial uh, paper in, in uh, uh, I think this was 2001 paper. Uh, BMI does not accurate, accurately uh, predict overweight in, 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 uh, in northern India. And this was the paper which was instrumental in making the guideline. So BMI is erroneous measure. So it's good for you know epidemiological purpose. What is clinical obesity? So this is the new term. And this is based on multiple Delphi consensus data from all multiple specialists uh, in, in, in India, almost 100 or more specialists. Presence of clinical obesity leads to dysfunction of body, organs, and thus posing functional limitations. Two examples, 
65 year old lady bmi 32 osteoarthritis of knees posing difficulty in walking 50 year old man having bmi of 39 with diabetes hypertension nephropathy and edema this is a clinical obesity this is not just simple obesity based on bmi do we add more measures to bmi to make it more representative of adiposity at depots and regional fat distribution it would be best to add measures waist circumference, waist to hip circumference ratio, or waist to height ratio. So BMI is not enough. We add more to measure abdominal adiposity. Is waist circumference a reliable marker of abdominal adiposity? Measurement of waist circumference is observer dependent. So it, there is a problem here. But still, it is it reflects CVD much better than BMI alone. So if you look at this, our paper, we looked at 12, 13 methods of measurement of waste with inspiration, expiration, empty stomach, full stomach, uh, stooping forward, straight, and so on. There were three to four cent centimeters different in each. And we said that unless you are well trained, you will not be able to measure waste circumference. So there is an observer problem. It waste height, heart. Uh, Waist hip ratio a reliable marker of abdominal adiposity. Again, there is a problem. Though waist hip ratio is a good marker for CVD, at least in Asian Indian population, but over a period of time it fails its uh, significance. For example, let's say this is a person who is a, a 30 years age. Waist is uh, 80 centimeter. Hip is 100 centimeter. Waist hip ratio is 0.80. Now, this person is 50 year old. Uh, BMI has increased from 24 to 35. Waist is 100 centimeter. Hip has increased to 125 centimeter. Waist hip ratio remains the same. Erroneous. Though, in cross sectional data, it is good reflection. It does reflect CBD in a, in a, in a robust manner. And waist height ratio, that's why Naval and uh, our group. Uh, uh, did some research. This seems to be an emerging uh, ratio. And this is the, our paper uh, in Northern Asian Indian population with high prevalence of cardiometabolic risk factors. A combination of waist circumference and waist high ratio appears to have a better clinical utility than BMI and waist hip, uh, uh, waist hip ratio in identifying individuals with cardiometabolic risk. So here are multiple ratios. We have talked about just obesity without a problem, and we have talked about clinical obesity. So, in the next revision, which is going to occur in next couple of months, 2009 and 15 years later, next revision, based on multiple Delphi consensus processes, should we combine two measures of obesity and functional symptoms? This is the last slide. To define clinical obesity, it may appear rational to do so for CVD production and application of intensive treatment. Here you are definitive to provide treatment because this or clinical obesity is going to cause problem. So BMI is mandatory plus waist circumference or waist height ratio plus restrictive symptoms. What are restrictive symptoms? Either shortness of breath or palpitation or locomotory problem knee pain, hip pain, etc. This is just obesity, epidemiological purpose, is useful. This is abdominal obesity, again useful for epidemiological purpose. But we combine the two and combine symptoms, then we get a clinical obesity. This is what we are going to propose for India. Thank you, sir.